Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. We're on part three of the likeness of sinful flesh. We're going to be talking about how man tried to tempt Jesus and get him to sin so he's not the likeness of sinful flesh, that he is sinful flesh. Okay? Remember, he's in a body that's corruptible, but he never got corrupted. Words have meaning. Corruptible means capable of being corrupted. It doesn't mean that they're corrupted. Okay? And we started this study with Romans 8, chapter 8. I'm just going to reread a couple, and then we're going to get into this study. Okay. There's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. All right. We've been doing these series because I want to start doing some studies on the birth of Jesus Christ, what's important about it. All right. And the number one thing that's most important, I believe, because of Scripture, is that he was born in the likeness of sinful flesh. He had a body in the Old Testament that's incorruptible, meaning it's not capable of being corrupted, glorified. And in the New Testament, he goes back to having his incorruptible body that's glorified, and it's not capable of corruption. Okay. The difference is, is the body that he was given when he came down was born of a virgin Mary. Um, it's born in the likeness of sinful flesh. That flesh is capable of being corrupted. That's why he got tired, he got hungry, he got sleep, uh, tired, sleepy, hungry. He felt pain okay. because he was in flesh that was likeness of sinful flesh. He grew old. He got, you know, from a baby all the way up to until he died on the cross when he was 33. But the important part of likeness of sinful flesh, if uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, I forgot to write these in my notes. So I'm trying to do them quick. Uh, let's use this. Isaiah 7, 14. What does it mean for Jesus to be in the likeness of sinful flesh? Corruptible body. Uh, 7.14 14-16 Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Future, future prophecy. 15 Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and to choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both their kings. Future prophecy. The eleven tribes, the king of the eleven tribes were no more, and the king of Judah was no more. They were under Roman control. Jesus came. But the important part of that is to choose the good and refuse the evil. Okay? Um, that's what it means by him coming in the likeness of sinful flesh. We don't always choose the good and refuse the evil. We fall into temptation. We fall into sin for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. We have corrupted bodies. Not just corruptible, but corrupted bodies. Jesus had a corruptible body, but he was never corrupted. But we talked about what it means to be likeness of sinful flesh. We talked about... Uh, Satan trying to tempt Jesus so he would be corrupted, that he would sin. Okay, Now we're going to be talking about man doing it. So, I got a lot of pages. I want to keep this up to an hour max. So I'm going to be reading this with my notes. I am a King James Bible believer. Okay, It is God's perfect written word in English. So we're going to start with Mark 12. Chapter 12, verse 13. We're going to be talking about man's power and authority. Is it above God? They tried to get Jesus to put man's authority above God's. Okay. So uh, remember another advice. You can, Like I do when I follow Brothers in Christ videos, you can pause the video and turn to the scriptures and then unpause the video. Okay. Because I would never be able to keep up. I'm such a slow turner. Um, so Mark 12, 13. And they send unto him certain of the Pharisees and Herodians. We'll talk about this. I had to look up a little bit of definitions of who these types of people are. Okay. To catch him in his words. And when they were come, they said unto him, Master, we know that thou art true. They're lying. They wouldn't believe that Jesus was true. And you're going to come across people who do that to you. Okay. 
and cares for no man, for thou regardest not the person of men, but teaches the way of God in truth. Is it lost, lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? There's more behind what they're trying to trick him with, and we're going to talk about that. Key word is tribute. Okay. Shall we give or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, a lot of that stuff that they just said, they're lying. Okay, they always they believe he's false. Said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny that I may see it. And they brought it, and he said unto them, Whose is the image and subscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered, answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Okay, Luke twenty twenty six has a different uh, uh, phrases it a little differently, and I like that phrase at the end. It said, "And they could not take hold of his words," because there it said, "And they marveled at him." That's all it says in Matthew or Mark, okay, seventeen. But Luke twenty twenty six it says, "And they could not take hold of his words." They're trying to get him to say something that was wrong before the people, and they marveled at his answer and held their peace. Okay. It's all about, as we get through this study, you're going to realize how man treats this God's word and how Jesus held to his word and wasn't a hypocrite. Okay, He didn't lie. Okay. So Herodians, we see there, a Jew Jewish political party who sympathize with the Herodian rulers in, the, in general, in their general. Okay, They're a political policy of government. They're political. Okay. And their main purpose, if I can read it right, the Herodians wanted political independence for the Jewish people. They wanted to be the ones in charge, the leaders. They had wanted people to be in subjection to them. Okay. And then you had the Pharisees. Okay, There's two things. The biggest thing people relate to the Pharisees is uh, they're a religious sect, but they held the traditions of men over God. And we're going to talk about some of the things they try to attack Jesus with, trying to hold the traditions of men, men being the authority, over the word of God. Okay. But the other thing that they wanted and they hated about Jesus is Jesus was taking their authority away. He was getting people to put God first and man second. Okay, And anytime man went against God, God comes first. He was taking their power over the people. Okay. So what's this thing about tribute? Uh, we're going to go through a few things in the Old Testament. Notice it didn't say taxes because that's what it was is taxes. Okay, they didn't use the word taxes. They used the word tribute. Okay. Genesis forty nine fifteen. Who do we give tribute to? Okay. And who did they give tribute to in the Old Testament? And he saw the that rest was good, and the land that it was pleasant, and bowed his shoulder to bear, and became a servant unto tribute, servant to the Lord. Okay. Numbers thirty one twenty eight. And levy a tribute unto the Lord of the men of war which went out to battle, one soul of five hundred, both of the of the persons, and of the beeves, if I'm pronouncing that right, and of the asses, and of the sheep. Okay, once again, they were given tribute to the Lord. Numbers 31, 37. And the Lord's tribute of the sheep was six hundred and three score and fifteen, and the beeves were thirty and six thousand, of which the Lord's tribute was three score and twelve, and the asses were thirty thousand and five hundred, of which the Lord's tribute was three score and one. Okay. And the persons were sixteen thousand, of which the Lord's tribute was thirty and two persons. And the Moses and Moses gave the tribute, which was the Lord's heave offering. And to Eleazar the priest, as the Lord commanded Moses. Giving tribute to the Lord is you're giving the Lord credit and giving him thanks. All that I have belongs to the Lord. And they were given parts of that that the Lord gave them and blessed them with as offerings, a tribute to the Lord. Okay, Not just offerings, but a tribute. Thank you, Lord. These are yours. I'm your servant. Even as a Christian, I'm a servant of God, a bondservant. I am yours. Okay. So, what's going on here? They wanted the people to hear that Jesus say to submit to a man. Give man the glory, basically. Okay? Give him tribute. So they could call him out for being a hypocrite. Remember, the Old Testament's talking about you give Jesus tribute. You give glory to God. You give him saying, thank you, Lord, you did this. 
I had no control. I couldn't do this on my own. It's a blessing. Okay. Remember, not taxes. People always try to grab that as taxes. It's talking about tribute. Okay. Jesus was getting the people to submit to God over them. See, and they were getting mad about it. He was taking their power and authority that wasn't given to them of God. We're going to talk about this. And saying, God's the one with the power and authority. Mm -hmm. If they could get Jesus to submit to a man over God, they could prove that he is a sinner as well as justify men giving tribute to religious leaders. Okay? There's donating money to a ministry... But you're still saying, God, this is a godly ministry. I want to see your work, Lord, continue through this person, and I'm going to give donations. But you're doing it for the Lord, okay? that the ministry, his work can continue. Okay? But what religious organizations do we know today, the biggest one that takes in so much money for themselves, has nothing to do with God? Okay? They want the power, they want the authority. Okay? Uh, the Catholic Church. They're a world leader, which we're going to talk about here. Okay, a world power. Right? The Herodians, remember, they wanted everybody back under their authority and be political. Just, they were trying to match the Romans, but they wanted to be political and have their own rule. All right. Uh, Romans 13, 1, if you want to turn there. Let every soul be subject unto the higher power, for there is no power but of God, the powers of that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. Remember in the Old Testament, it said, Nebuchadnezzar, my servant. Nebuchadnezzar was king at the time of what we call the, uh, what we call today, they're trying to do one world order. He was the king of all that, that, that area of all the people. He was a great king, but yet he was a servant of Jesus, of Jesus Christ, because I believe Jesus is in the Old Testament. God, okay. And they that resist us shall receive to themselves damnation. For the rulers are not a terror to good, but to evil. That's the key. Because people try, they'll try to tell you these religious organizations, it doesn't matter if we're wrong. It doesn't matter if we sin. It doesn't matter if we're going against God. You're to submit yourself to us over God. Okay? That's not what this is talking about. Good works, but the evil. They're supposed to be a terror to evil. Okay? Will thou then not be afraid of the power, do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon them that doeth evil. Talking about them that doeth evil. When Jesus said, render under Caesar the Caesars, and render under God that's God's, everything is God's. God put that man in um, power. He didn't usurp God and say, God doesn't want me here, but I got here of my own accord. Okay? It's not what's going on. They were, trying to get, uh, they were trying to get Jesus to give tribute to a man and hold man equal or higher than God. Okay? Um, Genesis 3, 4, okay? Trying to get, like I said, they're trying to get Jesus to give tribute to a man because Caesar, in the time, they treated Caesar as if he's a god. They did. So, who's really behind the Pharisees and the Herodians when it comes to this? Okay, Genesis 3, 4, let's go all the way back. Who was the one that told Adam and Eve they can be as gods, knowing good and evil? Men can be equal to God. Genesis 3, 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Okay. I'll just keep your read right. I can't even say it. I'm going to keep saying. Um, what they were trying to do is they were trying to get Jesus to give tribute to a false god over the real god. Saying this man is an equal authority, and he's equal to God. Okay. Acts, uh, what was Peter and the other apostles' response to this same, not the same situation, but in a situation where they're told to hold man's authority over God's authority? Okay. Men's, what men say over what God says. So Acts chapter 5, verse 27. And when they had brought them, they set them 
before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and tend to bring this man's blood upon us. Okay? They commanded them not to preach the gospel. They commanded them not to preach Jesus Christ. Okay? Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Would Jesus say, render unto Caesar that is Caesar's, and render unto God's that is God's? Okay. So they are trying to get Jesus to hold Caesar as a God equal to, to the true capital G God. G, Caesar is a lowercase g God to a capital G God. And who's the lowercase g God of this world? Satan. Who's behind all that? Satan. Those people weren't serving God. Those Pharisees and Herodians weren't serving God. They're serving Satan. Right? So here we see likeness of sinful flesh. Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. And remember he said, why did he tempt me? They were tempting him. They were tempting his flesh, the likeness of sinful flesh. Right? He did not fail. He chose the good God, capital G God. He's the one the true God over um, the evil that they were trying to do, getting him to worship two gods. Kind of like the Trinity, you know, trying to get people to worship more than one God. Right. Now, the next one we're going to go to is taking part, uh, Mark chapter 12, verse 18. So you can be turning there. Taking part of, God, of the, God's word and ignoring others. We're going to show a situation where they're trying to get Jesus to take parts of God's word and throw out the rest. Ignore parts. And do we see this today? We see this a lot where people will ignore parts of God's word. They pick and choose. Mark 12, 18. Then come unto him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. Right? Here's the hypocrisy again. They're the ones that are hypocrites. They're the ones that are failing as we watch this. The Pharisees and Herodians gave tribute to Caesar. And they were trying to get Jesus to do it so they could attack him. And yet they were guilty of it. Here, right there, they said there's, that they, uh, which say there is no resurrection. And they asked him, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, If a man's brother die and leave his wife behind him, and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were seven brethren, and the first took a wife, and dying left no seed. And the second took her and died Neither left he any seed, and the third likewise, and the seventh had her and left no seed. Last of all, the woman died also. We'll stop there for a second. In Deuteronomy chapter 25, 5, that's where we read this. Okay. If, a, was it, if brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to him, take to him to wife and perform the duty of a husband husband's brother unto her and it shall be that the firstborn which she bears shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead that his name be not put out of Israel now this is Old Testament it's not for today but that's where they're getting this something also to realize is they're setting up their own scenario notice that there was seven men seven brothers okay now, in the Old Testament, if you remember the story about Tamar, the daughter of Judah, where her husband dies, she has no son, and two of his brothers have to marry her, and God kills them because they spill it on the ground, and she's still without a child. So there's four men, and she has three of them that marry him, three brothers, okay? not seven. So part of me wonders, why didn't they grab that and use that as an example? Why'd they have to make up their own example? Once again, they didn't go to the Word of God. They went to man's words. Okay. Now, there's nothing wrong with having an example that's true. Here's an example that I've seen. It's, it's happened. But we should always try to relate to the Word of God. Say, okay, what examples does God give us? And what does God's Word say? Okay. Now, Mark 12, 23, we're going to continue. In the resurrection, therefore... They're acting like they believe in it, in the resurrection. They're trying to trip Jesus up. When they shall rise, as whose wife shall be of them? For the seven had her to wife. 
And Jesus answering said unto them, Do ye not therefore err, because ye know not the Scriptures, neither the power of God? Okay, we're going to stop there for a second. You go to Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, and we read, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Okay, it, this isn't the only one, but it talks about in the Old Testament about the resurrection. Okay. The, the Sadducees ignored God's word. They picked and chose what they wanted. They don't know the scriptures. Okay. The other thing it says also the power of God. 1 Samuel 2.6 in the Old Testament, the power of God. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. Okay. And I take that as, uh, when we it's a whole other study, but when someone gets pregnant, a woman gets pregnant, God's the one who decided that woman's getting pregnant. And there's a lot of, like, it's a whole other study, okay? He killeth people. He t determines when you get old and die. He determines when you die, whether you're young or not. You know, death. He's the one that controls. Nobody dies, and God's like, I didn't want him to die. Okay? Nobody's born, and God's saying, I didn't want them to be born. But let's keep going. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 53. This is the Old Testament, but for us, for the New Testament. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. There's a resurrection, and this is what they're attacking, the resurrection. It's prophesied in the Old Testament, and the New Testament we're told about it, okay? Uh, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which remain shall be caught up. Okay. The power of God. You're saying you're limiting God. God can't raise people from the dead. Um, uh, didn't Jesus raise people from the dead? Just that's another thing to think about. Jesus is God. He raised people from the dead. That's the power only God has. Right? And that power, uh, God has it, but God, I think God bestowed it. I can't remember, so don't hold me to this. Uh, another study about when he gave the apostles uh, the, the, um, basically the power to heal people. And I can't remember if raising the dead was one of them. But that's something that only God can bestow and allow, if we want to say it that way. Jesus raised people from the dead, and they still limited God's power. God can't raise people from the dead. Jesus did, but they had to deny that Jesus was God. Mark 20, uh, 12, 25, back to the story. For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are the angels which are in heaven. And as touching the dead, that they rise, have ye not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him? Jesus is using God's word, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. Okay. How many times do we come across people that they will ignore scripture and only grab what they want so they can believe what they want? We see it with uh, the Bible version issue. Uh, we can grab from the Bible because we have the perfect written word of God where you're not to add to or subtract from that how can you sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth without the perfect written word. Uh, uh, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. You can't know that you're eternally secure without a perfect written word of God and you're not even capable of believing in Jesus Christ without a perfect written word of God. The true gospel is found in the word of God. People pick and choose. They leave things out. Okay. Um, uh, dispensational teaching, a big thing uh, is the Godhead versus the Trinity. Uh, you can't use this Bible and prove the Trinity. Okay, They have to ignore verses, take verses out. They have to change definition of words. Okay. We come across these people. Okay. The Sadducees took what they wanted from the scriptures and threw what they didn't want out. Okay. They ignored scriptures in the Old Testament. Okay? They also limited God and took God and brought him down here. Well, God couldn't raise people from the dead, nor the power of God. 
So we see here that they try to get, they try to trip Jesus up. Whose wives are they? Okay, that's not the issue there. They were ignoring scripture. They, they tried to go around it. They ignored scripture in the Old Testament about the resurrection, and they ignored the power of God. Jesus quoted from the Old Testament. He quoted scripture, and he didn't limit the power of God. He was raising people from the dead. He knows, because he is God, and I believe in the resurrection because I'm not limiting God. The catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? But likeness of sinful flesh, they tried to trip Jesus up and try to get Jesus to pick and choose the word of God. Because they do this a lot. They'll try to slip you up, people today, and then they'll go to the Old Testament, but what about this verse? They try to get you to say something that's wrong, and I've made the mistake of saying things that are wrong because I get frustrated. That's why I don't debate. That's why I don't argue. You want to discuss the Bible? That's fine. But sometimes discussions can turn into arguments and debates, and when that time happens, the discussion needs to stop. Okay, come back to it another time. But when you keep it going, I've gotten frustrated before, and I've slipped up and said things that are wrong, and they'll try to hold that against me because then they'll turn around and grab verses. Would they have turned around and grabbed the verses in the Old Testament where it talks about the resurrection? Um, they, I doubt it because they really didn't believe it, but you know what I'm saying? People do that. Okay, Likeness of sinful flesh, they were tempting him to pick and choose from the Bible and to limit the power of God and bring God down to their level. Okay. That doesn't mean he's a sinner. It means he came in the likeness of sinful flesh, he had a corruptible body, and he was tempted by man. Okay. And we'll see this a lot. Mankind's always trying to tear Jesus. Uh, today they're tearing Jesus down, trying to make him equal to man. And he trying to make him out not to be God fully and completely. But in here, they're trying to tear God down, trying to get Jesus to tear God down. Okay, make him on equal level with mankind. So the next one, tradition over God's word. Here we're going to be talking about the Pharisees. Matthew chapter 15, verse 1, if you want to turn there. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, why do thy disciples transgress the tra traditions of the elders? Transgress the traditions of the elders. For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the, transgress the commandment of God by your traditions? They were holding man's authority over God's authority. Right? That's what, when you hold traditions of men over the word of God, you're holding men's authority over God's authority. For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father and mother, let him die the death. So we're going to stop there. Jesus is saying this. Is he just making this up out of thin air? I'm a man. It's my, he is God, but he's setting the example. Throughout the, his uh, earthly ministry, he is God manifest in the flesh, but he's setting an example for us to walk. Okay. Did he just make that up out of thin air? Okay. Turn to Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Right. The Old Testament says to honor thy father and thy mother that, thou, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So there, Old Testament, okay, it's the command of God to honor your mother and your father. Right. Exodus 21, 17, next chapter over. And he that curseth his father or his mother shall surely put to death. These are commands in the Old Testament. Jesus is referring to the word of God. God being the final authority and the command. Right? His command is above man's. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 15 verse 5 and keep going. But ye say, whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Is that the command of God? We just read it. No, he's supposed to be put to death. Okay. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your traditions. Okay. Stop there for a second. Today we have the Catholic Church that does indulgences. Well, you just pay us and we'll forgive you. Okay. You can make indulgences for the dead that are either in hell or that's for the people in hell. You can make indulgences. You pay money to have people's sins that are in, burning in hell forgiven. Okay. Traditions of men above the word of God. 
Deuteronomy 16, 19. I, hope, I wonder if I got that wrong, okay? Uh, because some of my notes sometimes don't get right. So let's look at this real quick just to make sure. Deuteronomy 16. Oh, 1619. I'm sorry. 1619. Okay. Yeah, 1619. Thou shalt not rest judgment. Thou shalt not respect persons. Neither take a gift, for a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. We see it in the Babel buildings. They become businesses because it becomes about money. Okay. Um, what we see going on here is if we just pay the Pharisees some money, they'll turn and look the other way. Oh, you're forgiven. All oh, it never happened. And they'll look the other way. That's what's going on here. They're trying to hold, they're saying, Jesus, why aren't you holding the traditions of men as if it's more important than the Lord? And Jesus throws it, trying to get Jesus, Jesus throws it back in their face. I'm trying to say it right. That you're the ones that hold the traditions of men above the word of God. And you make, uh, Another verse says, you make the, the word of God of none effect by your traditions. We just read that. We just read that there, sorry. You make God's word of none effect by your traditions. They hold the traditions of God above the word of men, above the word of God, and they're trying to get Jesus to do it. Jesus threw it back in their face that the commandment of God is above the traditions of men. Okay. And where in the Bible does it say you have to wash your hands before you eat? Is it something that I do and people should do? But what if you go hiking? I've gone hiking and taken some food with me. You know, I've eaten food without washing my hands. Right here. First Timothy 6, 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil, while some have coveted after. They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Okay, it, it becomes a love of money. Okay, uh, the love of money leads to, do you know what the love of money leads to? Changing or even ignoring God's word for the traditions of men. Okay, you have to do things the world's way to be rich. There's no way that you can do things God's way today in these last days. In the Old Testament, there was people that are rich that obeyed God. Um, but eventually, the richest man, Solomon, eventually he turned from God. Right? Started burning babies, sacrificing babies to a false god. Uh, Baal, I think it was. Okay. Uh, men's traditions do not trump the word of God. Remember Peter, <laughs> um, men ought to ra rather uh, obey God than men. Okay. Uh, let's continue Matthew 15, verse 7. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Their heart's based off the traditions of men, the love of money in this situation. Okay. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Okay. Second Timothy 3.16 All scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works okay we see there that their heart is far from me that the man of god may be perfect i've done a study and i think i've had a brother in christ do a study on having a perfect heart what does it mean to have a perfect heart your desire is to please god to glorify him in all things give him glory in all things give him thanks in all things and whether you do in word or deed do all in the name of jesus christ it becomes 100 percent about jesus christ and pleasing him and doing things God's way. Your heart's desire is to believe this book and follow it. And when you fail, God is faithful to forgive. Repent, forsake, and move on. Okay? Deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and get back to following Jesus Christ. Okay? That's what it means. Their heart's far from me. Their desire is not for, for God. 
and to do things God's way, their desires for mankind, for money and doing things man's way, the commandment of men. So they're trying to get Jesus to put men, men's commandments, men's authority, their words above God's word, above God's authority. Okay? They're tempting him. He's in the likeness of sinful flesh. He was born in it. Okay? He can be tempted, but he chose the good over the evil to stand by God's word and the command of God over the command of men. Okay? Now, we're going to turn to John 8.1. I should have said this earlier, but if you're catching on, uh, always keep a finger when we're talking about these different situations where they're men is trying to tempt Jesus because we're going to be jumping around the Bible, but we're always going to come back to the what's going on here. So John 8, 1. Okay, we're going to keep our finger there, but we're going to be jumping around a little bit. Okay. Jesus went up into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him and sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Right. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? Right. Uh, right there, there's two parts to understand there. They're trying to say the Old Testament says she should be stoned, and they said that she was caught in the very act. Okay, There's two things that's got to be there to put someone to death. Okay. Deuteronomy 17.6 at the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death, but at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. Did they follow this one? Yeah, they said they caught her in the very act. Okay. Leviticus 20.10 okay. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer, and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Okay, They're throwing this at Jesus. Are they following that one? Where's the man that committed adultery with her? He's not there. So they're tempting Jesus whether he will obey the law, the commandment of God, when they themselves weren't obeying it. They picked and choose what they wanted to obey, and they threw out the other. This they said, back to... John 8, 6, This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. Okay. I, I left this out real quick. Deuteronomy 6, 18. 16, 18. All right. Judges and officers shall thou make thee in all thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee throughout the tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. They would judge at the gates, and the gates are without the city. Okay, that's where judgment happens. They came to Jesus, they weren't at the gates. Acts 7, 57 is a good example of this. Uh, then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling up, and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, "Lord Jesus, receive my spirit." This is Stephen. Okay. They took him outside the city, condemned him. The people that put down the coats were the ones that were the witnesses, and they oftentimes threw the first stone. Okay, it was done at the gates. They brought her to Jesus and wanted to see if they were going. Jesus was going to say, "Okay, stone her." Would they have maybe gone out to the gates? But they don't mention it. Okay? That's just something to throw in there. But Jesus stoops down to the ground starts writing. And sometimes we wonder, I think that Jesus, what if he was writing, because I can't be 100% on this, writing a law, a commandment, that all those people were failing to uphold, that they were in sin. Okay, that's the first time okay, he writes this law down. But Jesus... Okay, yeah, number seven. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. The second time he started writing, what if he started writing their names? He's like, how did he know my name? 
starts writing their names underneath that command, like they were failing to obey, by, abide by that command. Okay. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and a woman standing in the midst. Okay. Notice to all this, Jesus didn't say, no, we're not going to stone her, like going against God's command. Okay. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Remember, before two or three witnesses. Okay. There's no more witnesses. Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. He's not saying she's innocent. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. In other words, she was guilty, but he's saying, don't do it again. But what were they trying to do? They were going and trying to get Jesus to only obey part of the law and not the all, the whole law. Okay. Jesus is being tempted to see if he will obey the scriptures command of God. We talked about this when the Pharisees weren't following it fully. They picked what they wanted and just brought her to, to him. What if one of the men that were there were the one, was the person who committed adultery with her? Okay. Who knows? But they didn't bring him to him saying, these two people are guilty of committing adultery. They didn't bring both of them. They just brought one. Jesus didn't fall for it. Okay. He abided by scripture because there wasn't two or three witnesses at the end. He abided by the law uh, and commandment of God. They did not. But once again, likeness of sinful flesh. They're trying to tempt him to get him to go against his own word because he is God. Did I jump ahead too much? Yeah. I missed out a part there. Okay. Next one we're going to be turning to is Matthew uh, 22, verse 35. Matthew 22, verse 35. This one is some of God's commands more important than others. Uh, some we should uphold. The other ones aren't a big deal. Uh, if you break them, you break them. It's no big deal. This is what's going on. They're trying to tempt Jesus. Matthew 22, 35. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? In other words, we're going to stop there. Say, in other words, which law is the most important one to uphold and follow? Okay. What's worth, you know, today, what's worth going to court over and what's not? You know, they try to do that today. The less important ones, you know, the less important ones do not have to be upheld and followed at all times. I mean, that's basically what they're coming to God saying, which were, which commandments of God are important and which ones aren't. Right. Which ones can, he, like in other words, man can have a preference. That's a way to say it. I can prefer these commands and ignore these others. They're not that important. Mm -hmm. They tried to deceive Jesus. Matthew 37, because they're trying to trick him and catch him in his words. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus wasn't going to get caught in his word. He wasn't going to be deceived, deceived into saying certain commands are above other commands. But if you turn to Exodus chapter 20, th verse 3, we're going to go through the, 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 all these commands. And always keep in mind what he said there. The love thy, Lord thy God with all thy heart. Having a perfect heart, we talked about earlier. And with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and love thy neighbor as thyself. Okay? Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart. Uh, soul and mind. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water underneath the earth. We see this a lot today. Right? People, we, I don't stand for people making images of Jesus Christ. It goes against scripture. Images of uh, the Holy Spirit. Images of God the Father. Or even symbols that represent all three 
or even the Godhead, the Trinity, they have symbols. Godhead doesn't have a symbol. You don't have a symbol for the Godhead, okay? a physical image. So if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and body and mind, you're going to obey that. You're only Because when you make an image, you end up worshiping a false god. It goes back to that first command. Verse 5, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, love the Lord thy God, and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath and the Lord thy God, and it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughters, thy manservants, nor thy maidservants, nor thy cattle, nor the strangers that is within thy gates. For in the six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and resisted the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Verse 12. Honor thy father and thy mother, and that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You know, you're not loving your neighbor the, the man, if you're committing adultery, or the wife, if you're committing adultery, okay, if you're killing them, okay? Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his maidservants, nor his, our manservants, nor his maidservants, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's, okay? Once again, Jesus was choosing the good over the evil. What was the good this time? All of God's word is important. That's why the Bible version issue is so important. Having God's perfect written word in your hands. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Okay? We're commanded to abstain from all appearance of evil. All these things you won't be able to do. Um, Jesus said, uh, and I might be jumping ahead a little bit, um, there's no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. The old man is dead and buried. You sacrificed. You died for Jesus Christ. In other words, the old man's dead and buried. You have the new man. Was the new man? You do whatsoever I command you. Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my words. You're to love the Lord your God with all your heart. Uh, Heart, soul, and mind. Okay, we're commanded to study the Word of God. So they're trying to get Jesus to pick and choose. To pick and choose the words, uh, what part of God's Word is important, what's not important. We come across this a lot. Okay, you have people that we talked about earlier, they'll change God's Word. They'll change definition of God's Word. They'll pick and choose. Okay, they'll take some things out, they'll add some things. They'll just completely go against it and put the traditions of men above the Word of God. Right? It's all about trying to get Jesus to sin. He's not just the likeness, and I'm talking about this like these people here, the lost world. He's not just a likeness of sinful flesh. He is sinful flesh. They are trying to get him to sin. The important about his birth is that he was born in the likeness of sinful flesh. Okay? He was born choosing the good and refusing the evil. Okay. Now, after all this, what was Jesus' response to shut them up? They were acting like, hey, we know the scriptures, we're abiding by the scriptures, and we're trying to prove that you aren't abiding by the scriptures. What did Jesus do to shut them up? Okay. Matthew 22, verse 41. Go back to Matthew chapter 22, verse 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord? Saying, The Lord saith unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemy thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? He was asking him, Here's the scriptures. I forgot to reference it, but this is in the Old Testament. 
here's the scriptures. Tell me what it means. You guys are following the scriptures. You guys under the, you're perfect. You're equal with God. In fact, they acted above God. Their authority was more important. They know better than God. Okay. Verse 46. And no man was able to answer him a word. Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Okay. That's what the temptation, I'm not saying it stopped there, but the point is, is Jesus knew the scriptures. They weren't going to trick him. They weren't going to get him to hold the traditions of men above the word of God, to pick and choose what they wanted, what he wanted. I'll, I'll abide by this law, but I'm not going to abide by this law. Well, you know, I don't want to believe in the resurrection. You know, like today, I don't want to believe in the Godhead. I just want to believe in the Trinity. I don't want to believe in the true gospel. I don't want to believe in eternal security, dispensational teaching. I'm going to pick and choose what I want. In fact, our next part of this study is going to be about how they take God's word and they're making these Bible perversions to try to make Jesus out to be a sinner. Tearing Jesus down, the Bible perversions. We're going to show the right readings and we're going to show the false readings that turn Jesus into a sinner, that tear him down, make him equal to man. Okay. Likeness of sinful flesh. Okay. He came in the likeness. He wasn't actually sinful. Okay. He chose, he was born choosing the good over the evil. So if you got things out of this, please get that down. Okay. Jesus was not a sinner. Okay? Jesus was not a created being. That was in the past studies. He had a body in the Old Testament. He has an incorruptible body. Incorruptible body in the New Testament. The res when Jesus rose from the dead, he ascended and got his glorified body. He went back to having his incorruptible body. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. A, corrupted, a corruptible body that was capable of being corrupted. And if he wasn't God, he had become corrupted just like the rest of us. He was never corrupted. That's proof that he is God fully and completely. So I want to leave you with a couple of verses. John 14, uh, 23 that we talked about. Okay. Jesus answered and said unto them, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. A sign of someone who's truly saved is they're going to love God's word. They're going to love it, they're going to believe it, and they're going to live it. And that's where we get to the, uh, talk to you about um, there's no greater love than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. You're going to love this book, King James Bible. You're going to believe it. And you're going to live it. That's what a Christian does. Okay. Colossians 2.8. This is a warning that we talked about. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Okay. We see that a lot, that philosophy spoils. Okay. After the traditions of men. We talked about that. They tried to get Jesus to go after the traditions of men. And God warns us that there's going to be people today trying to get you to go after the traditions of men. Okay. After the rudiments of the world, okay, trying to get you to do things the world's way. I'm going to pick and choose. The world picks and chooses what they want to follow and what they don't want to follow. Okay. These Bible versions, I'm going to shop for a Bible that best suits me and lets me and okay with my sin, basically. Okay. And what? And not after Christ. Okay. Jesus stood firm to the Word of God. He set the example. He's in the likeness of sinful flesh. He never sinned. We are sinners. But we're supposed to do our best to have a perfect heart with the Lord. To believe this book, the King James Bible, God's perfect written word in English, God's word, live it. It's our foundation in all matters of faith and practice. So thank you for watching this study. It's already gone almost an hour. I got it within an hour. So uh, grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you in Christ Jesus our Lord. i am also got my new camera, so this is going to take a while to get out. Um, 4K video, just going to throw this in there. Uh, I'm going to try the, this video in 4K, but when I uploaded it, I tried uploading another video. It's like every 10 minutes is like two, is like, uh, I can't remember, it's like, two gigs or something like that. So we're going to try this. So uh, I will see you in the next video.